Hello, and welcome to our webcast. I'm Amy Pendergrass with Moss Adams, and I'm going to get us started for today's session, How Captive Insurance Can Reduce Risks. Before we begin, I'm going to play a brief video. Welcome, and thanks for joining us. We're pleased to present another in our ongoing series of continuing professional education webcasts to help companies and individuals conquer challenges as they plan for what's next. Our presentation will start in a few moments. Before we begin, here are a few things to keep in mind. You can customize how you both view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can also adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons, each relating to a different aspect of our session. You can download the group attendance sheet and a PDF copy of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget to the right of the slide view. You can ask our presenter questions during the webcast by typing a question in the Q&A window below the slide view and clicking submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions during the presentation or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty during today's presentation, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. Today's session will offer you one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the requirements as specified by the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy. You must attend at least 50 minutes of the session and respond to at least 75% of the polling questions, which we'll ask throughout today's presentation. To respond to a poll, click the button next to your answer. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon in the CPE Progress widget to open a PDF file that you can save to your computer. Don't worry if you can't download your PDF certificate today. We'll email a copy to you in two weeks. If you're attending this webcast in a group, you must complete our attendance sheet to receive CPE credit. The attendance sheet is available in the slide deck and handouts widget. Please have all group members sign it and send only one sheet per group. Also note that CPE credit can be awarded only to participants registered as themselves and isn't available to participants who view the on-demand version. As a reminder, the presentation you're about to see isn't legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. And now I would like to turn it over to one of today's presenters, Ryan Suico, partner at Moss Adams. Thank you, Amy. My name is Ryan Suico, and I'm a healthcare and insurance partner here at Moss Adams. Again, I'd like to welcome our over 200 attendees today, spanning from the healthcare, real estate, manufacturing, and distribution, not-for-profit, and technology industries. We are very excited to partner and welcome our tech to this website. Moss Adams has had a long-standing professional relationship with Gallagher, the parent company for our techs. Gallagher is a global leader in insurance, risk management, and consulting services, and Artex is one of the largest captive management organizations in the country. Their breadth of service spans all industries and handle captive formation due diligence all the way through ongoing captive management. In today's webcast, we're going to cover the current captive market conditions, considerations in forming a captive, tax implications of captive formation, and other factors to consider as you are thinking about forming your own captives. Joining me here on this webcast are Jeff Kurz, Managing Director for Artex Risk Solutions, and Chris Bell, our Moss Adams National Practice Leader for Medical Group and Physicians. Jeff leads the Artex Risk Solutions North America M&A strategy and plays a senior leadership role in Artex sales strategy and complex sales. Chris Bell provides tax, strategic planning, and transaction planning services to captive insurance companies and healthcare organizations and is a frequent speaker and author on tax reform, the Affordable Care Act, and healthcare policy. And to kick us off, let's start with our first polling question. Amy, I'll pass it on to you. All right, thank you. So our first polling question is, what is the size of your company in terms of annual revenue? Uh, A, under 20 million, B, 20 to 50 million, C, 50 to 100 million, or D, over 100 million? 
and we'll give you a few moments to respond to the question. To participate, please click the button next to the answer you choose and hit submit. And I also would like to take this time uh, to remind you to submit any questions you have for the presenters in the Q&A window in your console. And you will need to respond to at least three of the four polling questions that come up throughout the presentation for CPE. And it looks like most everyone has had a chance to respond. So here are the results. And then Jeff, we will kick it over to you for your portion of the presentation. Great, thank you, Amy. Good afternoon and good morning uh, to everybody. Uh, as was said earlier, I'm Jeff Kurtz, Managing Director of Artex risk solutions. And what we wanted to do today is really talk about the basics of captive insurance and why it's becoming a, a topic of uh, interest in today's insurance marketplace. But before we do that, we wanted to kick off uh, with another polling question, just to kind of set the tone in terms of the, the level of experience with captives that you and the audience may have. Uh, whether A, you have no experience or, or knowledge of captives at all, uh, or some limited experience uh, in knowledge with captives, or that maybe your company has explored captives in the past, but at the time or for whatever reason the strategy wasn't uh, a good fit, or that you've actually worked with captives in the past, or uh, lastly, you currently have a captive. Um, so if you could respond to that, that would give us a good baseline of the, the level of uh, captive education and knowledge in the group. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so it sounds like uh, there's a lot of lack of experience or knowledge on captives uh, here with a few exceptions. And I, I think uh, the, the presentation that we put together today really addresses um, hopefully a baseline knowledge, a little bit of a captives 101 to, to give those of you without any knowledge of captives at all a, uh, a pretty good overview. Uh, I'll just give you a quick uh, additional background on Artex. Um, the, uh, as Rianne said, we are a uh, wholly owned subsidiary of Arthur J. Gallagher, the third largest captive manager in the world, uh, licensed in over 30 domiciles in the U.S. as well as their traditional offshore domiciles in the Caribbean, Europe, and Asia, um, with over 1,000 risk entities under management, from uh, single parent captives to large group facilities uh, and other specialty risk-bearing vehicles. So uh, before we jump into the whole presentation, we thought we may start, start uh, with a, a second uh, polling question here uh, that gives us a tone for maybe why you've uh, joined us today um, in terms of the, the current insurance market. And you know, there may be uh, one or more of these, so we put in all of the above uh, as, as an option here, but uh, is it because the price increases for your insurance uh, coverage don't really reflect your loss history and the risk that your company poses? Uh, is it the available uh, capacity in the marketplace? You just can't get the limits uh, that you really want to have to protect the company. Uh, is it that your coverage excludes certain key risks that your company is concerned with uh, and uh, that the, the current insurance marketplace is requiring you to take on more risk than you're comfortable with? And again, it could be all of the above, uh, or it could be another reason. So if you could respond to that, that would uh, be great. Thank you.
All right, great. Looks like a, a lot of people out there that need CPE credit. So thanks for participating in the polls. Um, and, and this is really what we uh, are seeing, a lot of both the price increases uh, as well as all of the above uh, in a difficult market. So uh, with that, um, you know, really uh, that, that response reflects a lot of what we're seeing. Uh, and we're, we're saying things that you probably already are seeing or know about here. Uh, but you know, in the last several years, uh, the market conditions have become more challenging in a hardening or firming, firming insurance marketplace. And uh, as we see these cycles of hardening pricing, um, you, you get obviously higher premiums, larger retentions or deductibles that insurance companies are requiring. And with that higher pricing and retentions, there's still tighter terms and conditions uh, where insurance carriers are excluding key items. Um, that uh, would otherwise p possibly be covered. And the old adage is uh, that in soft markets, when prices are low, you buy more insurance because it's relatively affordable. But in hard markets, the strategy is to retain more risk in order to be able to mitigate the pricing. Uh, and captive insurance companies over the decades have really provided an alternative uh, to companies that are taking on some risk in order to provide and finance the, uh, the total cost of risk of the company uh, for not just the insurance premium spend, but also a retained risk uh, layer. But in any captive conversation uh, that, that we uh, enter into, it's very important to start with this control continuum. And you may have seen, seen different versions of it uh, in various places over the years. But on the left, far left-hand side, you know, that's uh, really the, the buying insurance on a guaranteed cost basis, fully insured with no deductible, poses the least amount of risk uh, because you know there's sleep at night insurance there, that every claim uh, that is incurred is going to be paid by the insurance company. Uh, but you know, clearly that's more expensive and provides less control uh, to, to your organization uh, in the whole process. But as we move up uh, you know, further towards the top and, and further right of that uh, continuum, it's that the, uh, you're taking on more risk in the form of deductibles, uh, whether small or large, and uh, then oftentimes moving towards a group captive structure in which you may partner with others in, the, in similar industries to be able to, to share some amount of risk. Um, but really uh, where we end up landing there is companies that want more control and are willing and able to assume risk go to the single parent captive uh, or uh, sometimes even full self-insurance. Obviously more risk related to that, but with that comes more control. So as we talk about a lot of the nuances or specifics of captives, it's always important to think about how much insurance uh, it makes sense to buy in any given market. What's the right amount of risk to retain for the company versus paying an insurance company to take that off your hands? And uh, the captive then is, is an effective tool to help to finance the risk that the company uh, takes on. So you know, there are a lot of myths and legends and misconceptions about what a captive is, uh, but I like to distill it down to this, where it is truly a licensed and regulated insurance company in either one of the 35 U.S. states with supporting legislation uh, or in the traditional offshore domiciles like Bermuda and Cayman. But it is an insurance company. It's just owned and controlled by its policyholders. Uh, and it just does four basic things. It's going to manage a loss fund. So for the amount of risk the company is taking on, the company would pay premiums to the captive in order to uh, provide a fund for future claims. Uh, while those policy uh, or while those um, coverages are being written, the, the captive is going to pay back to the policyholder or the parent company any losses that are incurred in that retained layer. Uh, but while those premiums are sitting there from the time the premium is paid to the time a claim is paid out, those assets are going to be invested in a liquid portfolio. And that investment income helps to grow the loss fund and have more dollars with which to pay claims. And at the end of the day, it's going to return all of the underwriting profit or the retained earnings of the captive back to the shareholder. And you know, these are the same four things that every commercial insurance company does. It's that um, you know, we're doing it on a first party basis instead of a third party basis. And, and really we, uh, we look at it and say, well, uh, an insurance company, when they receive your premium, 
they're going to keep that investment income uh, for their own benefit from the you know for that period of time from premium payment to claim payment, and they're going to return underwriting profit to their shareholders, not back to you as the policyholder. So what we're really doing is just distilling it down to creating a more effective loss fund to cover losses instead of incurring frictional costs, transaction costs, and paying for an insurance company's large expense uh, load and their profit motive. So you're keeping investment income and you have um, no underwriting profit that's going away. So inherently, it should be more effective uh, to fund your risk in a captive than uh, to pay a third party to take that off your hands. Yeah, in the in the traditional captive uh, model, we, this is really what we look at here by saying on the left hand side, if I'm paying an insurance company a premium, it's really broken down into roughly uh, a scenario like this, where they're looking at your losses or your potential for losses that they would pay, and that's the bulk of the premium. Uh, but in addition to that, they have expenses related to policy issuance and premiums, taxes, and claims administration and all of those things that can add up. Uh, and then they certainly want to make sure that they have a profit that's built into that for their shareholders. On the right-hand side, conversely, you have a captive scenario where the losses are the same, whether you've transferred them or retained them. The expenses of having a captive are significantly lower than a commercial insurance company. And so as a result, both the savings of that plus the lack of the profit motive uh, relate to the long-term cost savings by by funding risk in a captive versus buying that from a third party. And the way that we really look at that in terms of what's appropriate for the captive to take on is really um, a, a very simple scenario of, of saying in, in this uh, example here, well, we know what our commercial premium is at any given um, uh, deductible or retention level. And if I said I wanted to go up to a higher retention level or a higher deductible, um, what's my premium savings going to be for taking on that additional risk? And so the, the formula is, is really a basic one that says what's the total cost of risk related to insurance premiums paid out plus losses that I'm going to incur within my deductible? And what's the, you know, the optimal point for me? So in this scenario here, we're taking commercial premiums of X, and in, at that retention level, we might have expected losses of a million. And so I'm going to add the X plus uh, the A there to get my total cost of risk. But if I then have my commercial premium be X minus Y, which is the, the premium break that I get, um, I'm going to save some premium dollars, but I'm also to, going to incur higher losses there uh, at the million 750 in this scenario. And so I'm going to take all of that and add them together, and what's the optimal uh, retention point for me? And that is a pretty good bellwether in terms of uh, deciding the amount of uh, you know, risk retention versus transfer, but taking into account uh, actuarially determined expected losses can change based on confidence levels, and that you know every scenario is going to have some potential adverse loss experience um, where losses are going to incur in greater amounts than expected. So just a, a general uh, scenario of thinking about what a captive might be able to to fund. Um, so why do why do companies use a single parent captive? Uh, well, it, it's setting up your own subsidiary to be able to have that loss fund for your own benefit down the road. Um, but it really does. It's something that helps to create a mechanism for predictability. So again, if I know I'm paying a commercial insurance company a certain amount of dollars for the, the, the risk that they're taking on, that's great, and obviously that's predictable. But what I don't know is what I'm going to incur in the form of losses, You know, how much and when I'm going to incur those losses over a period of time within my retained risk layer or my deductible. And so I could have in years one through three, very low level or no losses in a particular line of coverage. And then year four, I might have a large loss. And then year five and six go back down to a low level of losses. That creates a lot of lumpiness and, and lack of predictability, especially if I want to build in the cost of, of my insurance into things like my cost of goods sold or any OPEX metrics that I may uh, use that for. And you know, I always say if I were a CFO and I knew I was likely to have a $5 million loss sometime in the next five years, 
I'd rather pay my captive a million dollars a year uh, than absorb that uh, $5 million loss in a year I can't predict. I want to be able to budget and predict that a little bit more. So the captive creates a mechanism to pay a predictable premium over time uh, that you build into the, the P&L uh, to be able to absorb and reduce the volatility of those loss events. And as a result, it, it provides for a better accounting of the true cost of risk. Again, retained losses plus any insurance premiums paid out. For some of our clients, um, they'd like to take on more risk. And that's the right economic thing to do, uh, but they don't have the ability to do that. Uh, because they have contractual requirements, whether that's debt covenants or HUD requirements or any, anything else that dictate uh, the maximum amount of deductible that they're able to take to satisfy those contracts. Well, the, the, in that scenario, we would use a captive in partnership with a commercial insurance company that would provide uh, their policy and their paper uh, that to all outside parties looks like it's fully insured, but the captive would sit behind that fronting company in the form of reinsurance to take on the risk. So as a result, the, the captive becomes a necessary evil to be able to have the best of both worlds, both the, the economic benefits of retaining risk as well as satisfying uh, insurance requirements. Uh, for many of my uh, you know, multi-subsidiary and especially multinational clients, the captive really provides a great risk management tool uh, for distribution of risk and allocation of premiums. So if I have uh, maybe three dozen subsidiaries across the globe, uh, each of them ha are exposed to potential risk for large deductibles uh, or self-insured retentions. Well, you know, a large loss event can really help uh, affect one of their, uh, their local P&Ls if they have that bad loss year. If, however, I, each of those subsidiaries pays a premium to the captive, they have predictability now at their uh, local P&L level. And all of that risk from all of the subsidiaries worldwide are being distributed in the captive. And the greater the, the number of risk units, the more predictable it is. And so it helps to smooth out and, and distribute that risk among the companies. And then we can use the captive as a tool to allocate premiums to those uh, participating subsidiaries on multiple different uh, methodologies whether that's uh, loss history based, whether that's exposure based, or uh, a blend of the two. You know, we want to have some predictability for the subsidiaries, but we also maybe want them to feel a little bit of the pain uh, of a loss uh, that reflects maybe their lack of quality risk management or safety programs. So it really becomes a great risk management tool uh, to be able to, uh, to really look at where the risk of the company is coming from. And because the captive is a true insurance company, it can now have direct access to reinsurance markets. Uh, so uh, you know, writing, buying insurance from your captive directly that then buys reinsurance can be a more effective way uh, to access markets. First of all, it's going to give access to more markets that are out there um, in terms of um, you know, markets that might be in Bermuda or London or Europe, et cetera. Uh, Secondly, the, it, it could be marginally less expensive because you're buying wholesale versus retail now by directly accessing those markets. Uh, and while it, it can be marginally less expensive, the real reason our clients do that is because it does give a, a greater uh, potential of accessing uh, capacity and insurance limits where that's very restricted in today's market. Uh, so it, it really can uh, create more stability for a program long term, especially in things like property and uh, significant exposure and liability markets. And then uh, lastly, I won't uh, uh, you know, go into this piece. We'll hear, uh, hear a, bit, a little bit later from Chris on, on the tax issues. But there is, uh, if structured correctly, some uh, potential preferential tax treatment uh, related to the use of the captive. Uh, so you, you can say, well, you know, fine, I can just take on um, some additional uh, risk in the form of self-insurance or large deductibles. Uh, but what, you know, what's really the comparison of a captive versus just a self-insurance program? Both are going to relate to a lower insurance cost because I'm taking on more risk. Um, if we have tax deductible premiums, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, but a captive can provide... Uh, greater control over the claims process because for that large layer of risk you're taking on, 
Um, you can hire your own third-party administrator versus relying on the commercial insurance company to settle those claims for you. And now you have more control over whether to fight or, um, or to settle a claim and really have a third-party administrator that's working for you versus the insurance company. Uh, the captives can also provide some limited amount of asset protection. Uh, so those assets being set aside, that may be out of the reach of other parties and still allow them uh, to, have, uh, to, to have the loss fund there to pay future claims um, you know, for that. The investment income, um, you know, certainly from a, a self-insurance standpoint, there's no mechanism to invest the portfolio. And so where you may have a liability on your balance sheet that could be on a non-discounted basis versus a discounted basis in the captive and having that loss fund grow. Uh, and policy design control is important. If I, if I manuscript a policy with my captive, I know that it has all the terms and conditions that I need. Uh, if, however, I'm uh, just buying a large deductible or self-insurance, I'm still subject to the terms and conditions of the excess carrier. Um, and so I, I, that might not be as uh, effective as I really need to. And we talked a little bit about the uh, access to reinsurance markets as well. And I, and I did see a question come in um, while we were talking about this slide about potential for a not-for-profit to have a captive. And this is really the scenario that we go through with our not-for-profit clients, which is uh, there's no tax motivation, certainly, but all of these other benefits outside of tax really relate to using a captive versus just retaining a self-insurance fund, uh, particularly because of the, uh, the investment income, the asset protection, the smoothing out of the cost uh, over time, and uh, really the ability to formalize the program, and, and also because of predictability. Again, I'm paying a premium to the captive year to year uh, versus having a self-insurance fund that much like a pension plan, I'm just going to top it off year to year. And that really doesn't uh, create a lot of predictability in terms of the expense uh, that, that a captive might provide. So just in uh, very quickly here in terms of the structure of it, um, put together a little bit of a view of the captive flow of things. Uh, we have our operating entities there in the upper right-hand corner. They're still going to be buying some level of insurance uh, from the commercial market for those catastrophic losses. But that policy, uh, whether bought on an excess basis or in the form of a large deductible, it's going to include those that deductible risk as well as potentially any exclusions or, or things that, that are not covered by it. Those operator entities would buy a separate and distinct policy from the captive uh, to re reimburse them for any of the losses that the commercial carrier doesn't pay. And so that commercial carrier neither knows nor cares that you have a captive in place. It's just a formalized mechanism to cover the, the risk that the commercial market isn't. So a relatively simple uh, example there. A little bit of a, a twist on that is, as I said earlier, you may partner with a fronting company. Uh, and that fronting company is an admitted licensed insurance companies, uh, company in all states, and companies like Zurich, Hartford Travelers, AIG, others uh, that you'd be familiar with. And they're writing the policy uh, that, to, again, to the, all, the outside world, looks like a fully insured policy, but they're laying off risk. In, in this example, the first $250,000 of any loss, they're laying that off to the captive. So they're paying the, uh, some premium to the captive, and they're uh, transferring some reserves or potential losses to the captive as well. And then there's excess coverage uh, above that to take uh, on the risk above that 250000 uh, because the fronting company is putting their paper out there to the state uh, regulators and to any outside parties, the, uh, it, that fronting company has the legal obligation to pay all claims that come in under that policy. And as a result, uh, you know, if the captive that they're passing off risk to, if that captive somehow went away for whatever reason or couldn't, couldn't uh, reimburse them for those, those losses, then um, you know, you know, they would be on the hook for those. And so they require a, a, um, a letter of credit or other collateral to secure them for the expected losses within that $250,000 layer. Um, and, and so it, while the economics of that risk retention are the same, it just goes through 
uh, the, uh, the additional, um, additional step there. And then one last um, hybrid example here, which is uh, the segregated and sell or protected sell insurance company. And the, the insurance program on the fronted basis looks exactly like our last scenario. Uh, however, the reinsurance is being uh, sent to not a single parent captive, but what we call a protected sell insurance company. And I like to use the analogy that it's like a rental storage unit for risk. So there are many unrelated companies that are participating or renting space. And company one is going to park its risk in one garage. Company two is going to park its risk in the garage next to it. But they're legally segregated. So um, they can't get to each other's risk or assets. And there's no recourse against um, the assets of any company from the losses of another. So it's just renting a facility, which sometimes can be very uh, helpful for uh, you know short-term types of risk programs uh, for something that needs to be uh, entered into very quickly or for a short period of time where you may want to just use it as an incubator and move on later. And it can be less expensive because you're renting the space versus building your own. Uh, but just another model, but the economics of the risk, again, uh, work very similarly, if not the same. And some of the, the, the keys to, to really success on this is really looking at um, what the market coverage and capacity that's available out there that, that is. You know, again, relating to the amount of risk that it makes sense to take on and where to really exploit the insurance marketplace for what it can provide you um, versus what it's not very, very efficient at uh, in any particular market. Uh, the policy qualification and the contractual obligations obviously leading to not just um, uh, the contractual requirements and the need for the fronting company, uh, but any other requirement that you may need to satisfy. It could be a government contract. It could be for our healthcare care clients um, qualification with uh, the state rules related to patient compensation funds. You know, really making sure that we understand all of those things so that setting up a captive, it doesn't run afoul of that. And, and frankly, uh, the understanding that a captive is a long-term commitment so it's not jumping into a captive when the market is difficult and then jumping back out when it uh, softens up again. But it, it's a long-term different view of how to, to retain and finance risk. And where uh, many companies get into a captive arrangement for the long-term cost savings, the cost savings is really long-term. It may not be in year one uh, because you're still paying premiums to a commercial carrier you're, you're paying a premium to your captive for the retained risk, uh, and that um, amount of cash flow may be equal to or even possibly exceed um, what, what you're paying now. But the, the savings comes from the long-term realization of claims in a lower amount than the commercial insurance companies would be charging you for. And for things like workers' compensation or professional liability, you know, we all know that an incident that occurs today may not be finally settled out for a number of years. And so we need to really have that look back after three, four, five years, uh, look back to year one to see if it was truly uh, a cost savings or not. So it really does take a longer term view uh, in order for the captive to be successful and that the funding levels and the collateral requirements and capital requirements may be a, a short term uh, you know, cost uh, to, you know, investment in the strategy, but it should pay off over the long term. Um, and really a key uh, mind to risk management and how that relates to the captive. Uh, I always say nobody ever washed a rental car. Uh, so, you know, once it's yours, you take care of it, right? Well, the same thing is with a captive. Um, you know, we're taking on risk. We're formalizing our risk program and taking more control of that. And so the risk management, the safety programs, uh, loss mitigation, all of those things really need to have a heightened awareness uh, that because now every dollar of loss is going to hit the bottom line directly versus being transferred to an insurance company. And so a direct correlation and a positive correlation between risk management and the financial outcomes using the captive is very important. And what we oftentimes see is the earnings from the captive uh, can be reinvested back into quality risk management to create a positive cycle of the greater risk management, lower claims uh, that continues to, to build 
uh, the, the positive risk profile of the company. Uh, claims administration and defense, and, and that's back to re really looking at a third party administrator that really understands um, you know, the, the ins and outs of the reasons why a particular claim occurred. Does it make sense to fight that claim in court? Uh, or is it something that's just better settled out to get rid of quickly? Again, using that control and uh, exercising that judgment on your own behalf to be able to do that. And part of the long-term commitment is management support uh, for this. We're changing uh, the fundamentals of, of how to look at the financing of risk over the long term. And that's got to have management support to be able to say, we're making an investment in this. We're really uh, putting in place uh, the, the risk management structure to be able to, to support this uh, versus uh, you know, being fickle about it, as I said earlier, jumping in and out of a captive, which really doesn't work well uh, long term. So some of the, the really those are some of the keys that we've seen over the years uh, that make it successful. Uh, so where are captives formed and regulated? Uh, the traditional offshore domiciles of Bermuda and Cayman here for U.S. companies, uh, although Guernsey, Malta, Gibraltar, Ireland, others uh, have uh, have vibrant captive programs as well. But for the U.S. risks, we tend to see Bermuda and Cayman be the predomination of the offshore domiciles. And offshore, they can be at a marginally lower cost to run, uh, but really it's the lower uh, regulatory requirements and capital requirements uh, that, that tend to take folks offshore. Uh, the capital requirements uh, are, are such that you know, starting any company, including a captive, there's initial seed money that goes into it to support it. And regulators onshore or offshore are going to require a capital contribution in addition to the premium funding to support the captive as it starts. Those tend to be uh, lower offshore. Uh, and the, the, the formation process can be more expedited and, and uh, wrought with less bureaucracy than you may see in the US. Uh, and even though your, your captive may be offshore, the days of having the bank accounts and the investments required to be offshore are long gone. Um, the investments can stay in a qualified US bank or an asset manager, and um, that um, you know, the tax answer, as you'll hear later, um, is, is something that even though you're offshore, you can make an election to be taxed as a U.S. company, so really no difference there. Uh, but, but that being said, there are 35 U.S. states with supporting legislation. I think I saw a question come in earlier as to whether California was one of those. It is not. Um, but there are 35 U.S. states, and of those states, there are probably a small uh, subset of those that are really vibrant and mature, Vermont being the biggest and longest standing. Uh, Hawaii is very popular with our West Coast clients due to the geographic proximity. Uh, but D.C., Tennessee, South Carolina, Utah, others have large programs and good infrastructure uh, that's, th that's there. Uh, but they do have a higher capital requirement. And they do have some concerns if you wanted to write uh, any third-party business. So if you think, think of things of extended warranty programs uh, or other similar types of risks that your captive might want to take on, those can be a little bit of a concern for U.S. regulators uh, and can cause the capital requirements to be even higher. So the key considerations uh, really are, do you have a, a captive regulator that understands your industry and the type of risk that you're going to write in the captive. And to me, it's much like insurance underwriting, uh, where the value of information is very important. Uh, if an insurance underwriter doesn't really understand a risk, they're going to tend to reflect that lack of understanding into higher insurance premiums. And, and by the same token, an insurance regulator, if they don't understand the type of risk and how the, the, the policy is going to, to act, uh, they may have a, a little less um, less understanding of it, and that's going to relate to potential more uh, potential additional regulation. So a domicile that understands the, the industry is important. We talked about the capital requirements uh, and the regulatory flexibility. Uh, you know, again, are they going to require third party business or uh, allow third party business? Are they going to allow, <clears throat> um, excuse me, are they going to allow flexible ownership structures? Um, you know, we have some captives that have uh, a subset of uh, the key management as uh, minority owners in the captive. You know, how, how flexible are they going to be related to some of those things? 
And then there's certainly the perception risk. And, you know, the worst thing that ever happened to the Cayman uh, captive uh, program was when John Grisham wrote The Firm. Everybody thought you were hiding boxes of documents in a condo somewhere in Cayman. And it, just the opposite is true. It's a very highly regulated and respected insurance regime in Cayman. But that perception can be real, uh, especially for many of our public entity and not-for-profit clients, uh, where boards may raise the question of, all things being equal, can we do this in the U.S.? Because we just don't like the optics of having uh, a bank account or an entity uh, offshore. And so those perceptions uh, can be real, and that can uh, lead to, even with some of the potential downsides to being onshore, it can lead to really more of a, of a comfort zone related to, uh, to wh where to place the captive. So we just wanted to go through just a few quick uh, case studies here. Uh, we give you an example of how uh, we've used captives for our clients. Uh, for a large uh, real estate risk, uh, back to my earlier example on um, you know contractual requirements, uh, a large real estate risk that really wanted to be able to take on a lot more risk, leverage their own balance sheet to to finance their own uh, risk to a significant amount, and uh, we, so we were able to put in place not just a, a fronting uh, arrangement to be able to uh, satisfy those debt covenants, uh, but also uh, have direct access to reinsurance markets where they had broader capacity uh, options and they had multiple carriers that were sitting above them in what we call a quota share. So uh, multiple uh, tens of millions of dollars of, of coverage above the captive with each carrier taking 20% of the risk. Uh, from ground up, <clears throat> and so that <clears throat> excuse me, so that created greater uh, insurance carrier diversification. So that if one carrier were to pull out and not want to be on the risk any longer, then we were just faced with filling in 20% of the risk versus 100% of it. Uh, and in this case, we were the, the captive. Uh, they decided for the captive to take on that 20% uh, as a co-insurance uh, to save additional dollars with limited amount of risk. So it really can create a nice um, a nice platform for large property portfolios uh, across the board. Um, we do have uh, a lot of healthcare business with physician groups and hospitals, and uh, you know there's a lot of private equity uh, money that is rolling up a lot of physician groups uh, to really create some economies of scale. And uh, the problem was that we, they didn't all have uh, they all had their own separate policies. They were all overpaying for the, the premiums, uh, and we really found that there was some uh, great economic benefit by combining those risks and creating a distribution of that risk for more predictability across the board. And so we, we were able to combine both the professional liability and the workers' compensation uh, by employing a fronting company that would write the policies to all the entities with the captives sitting behind it. And so now we had uh, the ability to really have some great uh, cost savings uh, by buying uh, on a larger scale with greater premium spread and, and created a nice, uh, nice predictable platform for that. Uh, we do a lot of work with uh, uh, large universities and colleges as well. And in today's market, um, that's a very difficult challenge trying to get coverage for a lot of risks that colleges are facing. You may have heard about the USC verdict uh, a few weeks ago, where they got hit for uh, over a billion dollars uh, worth of uh, worth of claims uh, related to uh, sexual abuse and molestation uh, claims in their healthcare facilities. Well, colleges across the board are facing this, and uh, you know, insurance markets are saying that's just the risk we're not going to take anymore. So, the sexual abuse and molestation coverage, traumatic brain injury, uh, and related issues that can cause large lawsuits or from uh, the fact that you know, they were, their, their health facilities were uh, prescribing opioids, uh, et cetera. All of those things lead to large claims and they get excluded because insurance companies don't want them. It doesn't mean the, uh, the, the, or the, uh, the client doesn't have the risk. It just means they don't have an effective way to be able to predict or finance that. So re creating a captive policy to cover those and, and have an actuarially determined premium about setting those dollars aside really was able to create 
uh, a better way to smooth out those potential losses and build up a loss fund over time to take the pain out of a, of a potentially large uh, event. So we just wanted to, to um, also go through very quickly here uh, the, the process of a captive. You know, how do you really look at it and what's the, the process of getting something from an idea to reality? Uh, it all starts with a feasibility study. And there are um, really uh, two pieces to that. Uh, first is really identifying the type of risk or the lines of coverage uh, that you want to study and, and really uh, understand the use of the captive for. Um, so understanding those lines of coverage and then having an actuarial analysis done to look at what the losses would expect it, uh, to be incurred are and what the, the premium funding for those losses would be. And so there's a quantitative analysis to that, uh, which looks at the captive's potential balance sheet on a pro forma basis, uh, as well as its income statement, and you know, build that out so you know what the, the funding uh, would likely be. There's also a qualitative portion to that, which is understanding everything from the captive domicile, uh, where you want to be, to how the structure is set up, the corporate governance issues, capital required, collateral, regulatory and tax issues, all of those things that provide an analysis of every decision-making point that you need to consider in order to, to feel comfortable moving forward with that. The cost of that can run from 30 to 40,000, uh, depending on the scope of the study, the more lines of coverage, the more complex it is, obviously, and the cost of actuarial uh, that's there uh, in, in, inherent in that. But once you have uh, all of those decision-making points and the company makes the decision to move forward with it, then we move into um, the formation stage of things. And that's really taking the, the feasibility study as the basis of the business plan and sitting down with the regulators and the domicile that's been selected, uh, introducing to them the company as well as the captive business plan and saying, here's our vision of what we want the captive to do. Here's the analysis that we've performed. We've considered all of these key issues and we'd like to get an insurance license uh, at that point. Uh, the cost of that from the legal, uh, uh, legal fees for the setup of the captive or the entity through the business plan, the corporate secretary or work, license fees, all of that can add up to roughly between twenty five and thirty five thousand depending on the domicile uh, at that point. Usually takes about thirty to forty five days. Most domiciles would would prefer to have at least thirty days to consider an application before approval. Um, and, and the rest of the time is really document gathering in terms of background information about the company, compliance information for uh, Patriot Act compliance and anti-money laundering compliance and all of that regulatory uh, stuff. Uh, but roughly 30 to 45 days can be a little bit longer, again, depending on domicile. Uh, but once you've got your captive set up, you're writing the coverage, you've got it funded, uh, then we're into the management phase of that. So you're operating an entity on a year-to-year -year basis, and uh, the premiums are paid in, and from those premiums, it paid, uh, claims are paid out, but the captive also has its own expenses uh, that are going to come out of the premium as well. And we usually estimate about 80000 to 105, somewhere around that, uh, in terms of, of the, the price per year, and that's related to, <clears throat> excuse me, that's related to uh, the ongoing management of the captive, and that's what our techs does on an outsourced basis. We manage insurance companies for our clients, and uh, that's the accounting, regulatory compliance, claims reconciliation, everything that needs to be done to run the captive on an outsourced basis. But in addition to that, um, there's a, requ a requirement to have a, a financial statement audit done every year uh, with those financial statements provided to the regulators. Uh, there is an actuarial re uh, uh, report that's required annually, and there can be additional license fees um, for renewal, and then other additional um, potential costs related to board meetings and other miscellaneous administration. So again, depending on the domicile and the complexity of the captive, uh, that's really what you should expect. But all of you know, one of the common questions is, do I have to have additional staff? or do I have to have uh, you know, additional people to be able to run this? Is it going to take a lot of time? 
and it's really being done on an outsourced basis. So other than the oversight and the coordination with, uh, with us as the captive manager, it takes relatively um, little time out of the company's staff uh, to be able to, to continue the captive management at that point. And then, uh, you know, lastly here, we just wanted to kind of give you a view of the, the captive life cycle uh, and the things that are involved with that. On the front end, you really want to have the strategic planning, and that really comes into the feasibility, formation, and the management of the captive. Uh, and that, that's really getting things moving and getting your feet underneath you on that. But we also understand that, you know, mature captives, uh, or as, you know, as they get more mature, um, you really want to take a step back and say, is this doing what we thought we wanted it to do? Uh, do we need to do something different with it in terms of restructuring or additional lines of coverage? Or, or do we want to merge it uh, with another entity, et cetera? So keeping a dynamic view of the captive uh, can be important. And I, I always you know, come into projects um, that somebody will ask me to take a look at a captive from a tune-up or, or uh, restructuring perspective. And we ask the question, you know, if you weren't already doing it like this, would you start? And so, you know, the company, the operating company, the parent company is going to be dynamic and evolve over time. The captive should really evolve uh, with it as well and be able to respond to emerging risks. And so that's really sort of the beginning or the, the, the middle portion of the, the life cycle. Uh, but just like any other company, it could come time that it's time for an exit strategy for the captive, uh, whether the parent company is being sold off, uh, whether it no longer makes uh, financial sense to run the captive. And so we want to look at exit strategies uh, from that. And it can be everything from having third parties buy out uh, the losses of the captive. It could be the third parties uh, in their vibrant markets out there that buy out the entire entity of a captive and take on all of those liabilities as well. Or we just um, put it in runoff and uh, look at how we can tax efficiently wind it up uh, over time and then uh, go on with a different strategy. Uh, so I, I guess with that, um, you know, one of the things um, that we were uh, you're talking about earlier is uh, some of the tax implications of a captive, potential pitfalls, as well as uh, tax planning opportunities. And so I guess with that, I'll segue over to Chris, uh, who will go into the tax implications of uh, forming and owning a captive. Chris? Thank you, Jeff, uh, and for all the detail you went through. And <clears throat> I know everybody's excited to go through tax details right before lunch, uh, but I promise you it'll be riveting. Um, we're going to start off with the, uh, the final poll question for uh, continuing education credit. Amy? All right. Thank you, Chris. So our last question is, to what extent have you consulted with a CPA firm about the tax and financial statement issues for the captive entity you are considering? And there are several options that you can pick from below. Uh, select the one that works for you and hit submit. And then while we're waiting on that, for those of you that would like a copy of today's slides, you can download them from the folder that says slide deck and handouts. And we will also be sending the slides via email tomorrow along with a recording of the webcast. And once you have completed all CPE requirements, you will be able to download a PDF of your certificate from the CPE progress window. And we will be emailing it out within three weeks if you have any difficulty downloading it now. And it looks like most everyone has had a chance to respond. So here we go, Chris. All right, thank you. It sounds like uh, the majority of folks have had limited or no conversations with their CPA firm. Uh, that's not unusual, and it segues into um, really what some of the key tax issues tend to be. Um, they're often, uh, I don't want to say afterthoughts, but, but some of the tax questions come up um, because it's not the leading concern that drives uh, the captive. It's when done right, the tax issues are secondary, not the primary purpose for setting up the captive. Um, given the amount of time that we have, we're going to go through this section pretty quickly. Um, some of the common tax issues, and I'm using property and casualty insurance as, as 
kind of the, the general examples here. Um, but you have large and small captives. What we're talking about today are large captives. These are 831A captives. If you search online about tax implications for captives, you'll see a lot of focus on micro captives or small captives or 831B captives. That's not what we're talking about today. So I only reference that to make sure that you understand the difference. You're looking at large captives and the tax implications are very different. We're going to go through a little bit of the tax methods of accounting, uh, focus on federal and state filing, some of the unique federal tax adjustments, and then what some of the IRS concerns are around certain captive arrangements. So when forming a captive, risk management should really be the primary focus of forming a captive, and the tax issue should be a secondary concern. There are tax benefits, and we'll go through those now. Um, in using the example that Jeff brought up earlier, if you're an organization that's trying to set aside money each year towards a future loss event that could be potentially large, if you simply put money into a loss fund inside of the company, then the money that you're setting aside each year is not tax deductible. Um, it's staying inside of the organization. It's not an insurance premium. It's just going into a separate uh, investment account inside of the company towards a future loss event, and then you would receive all of the deductions in the year of the future loss. Because of the way the ways that net operating losses work for tax purposes, this isn't a very tax efficient approach. So forming a captive allows the sponsoring organization to receive uh, premium deductions as they're making payments to the captive each year. On the captive side, while it does have premium income, it's also allowed to accrued um, it's claims reserve or a, a accrued uh, claims. And so its taxable income is only a fraction of the premiums it receives in a particular year. Um, there, we've already covered the two types of captives, large versus small. Let's come over here to the tax method of accounting. Um, in the final version of the slides that are being mailed out, uh, there will be one addition to the slide. If you're a traditional insurance company, you would use the statutory accounting method that occasionally conflicts with tax principles and rules, and in those circumstances, tax rules take priority. For most captive uh, insurance arrangements, GAAP, or generally accepted accounting principles, is the starting point uh, when you look at, um, at uh, how the taxes are then calculated. So you're using it in a cruel method of accounting. There are a number of federal and state filings that everyone should be aware of. Um, I'm talking here about organizations that are either domiciled in the United States or have made the 953D election for a foreign entity to be taxed as though it's a US uh, corporation. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017 put pressure on a lot of uh, foreign or companies that are, are domiciled outside of the United States to elect to be taxed as U.S. corporations. Um, they get a, a slightly better tax advantage. The consolidated tax filings are an option for some organizations. Uh, if you file a standalone entity, you'll file a C corporation tax return. If it's a property and casualty um, captive, it would be an 1120-PC form. There was a question in the chat about whether there are nonprofit versions of captives. Technically, there's, there is a 501c15 uh, captive that is nonprofit, but it has to be quite small. The annual premiums have to be less than $600,000 a year. There are a number of other requirements. Uh, I, I haven't seen any come up uh, with any of my tax exempt clients using that, that strategy, but, but there is a, a code section that that has at least some exception for that. There will be state filings for premium taxes paid in some of the states. Um, it's based on gross premium sourced to that state. It's a low nexus threshold. So if you're, if you're registered and, and issuing premiums in a particular state, then you should be checking to see if you have premium taxes. Some states will require an income or a franchise tax filing in addition to premium tax filings. That's not as common, but it's something that you have to research um, when you set up a captive. There's some unique federal tax adjustments when you're dealing with any insurance entity, and, and captive insurance is a form of insurance. We call this the 20% haircut on unearned premiums. It's really a 20% uh, adjustment for the year-over-year -year change in unearned premiums. 
advanced premiums received are also subject to that 20% haircut. Um, there's some discounting of unpaid losses and loss adjustment expenses. These are based on tables the IRS issues every year. Um, with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act um, of 2017, the effective um, rates that were used for this discounting went up a little bit. Um, but those are, uh, they're based on the line of insurance that is being used in the captive. And so it's an area that if you're working with an organization that doesn't spend a lot of time with captives, it can easily be overlooked. There can also be some reduction in the benefit for dividends, received deductions, or tax-exempt interest uh, when you're an insurance entity. The IRS has a few uh, key concerns. A lot of these are, are from micro-captives, very small captives that the IRS often looks at as being abusive. But the concerns help to clarify issues that they also look at in large captives. So when you're looking at a large captive, what they're fundamentally trying to get at is whether or not it's a true insurance uh, relationship. There's a clear transfer of risk for a premium. The premium rates are reasonable. There are claims activity being paid out over time, and it's being run like an insurance company. And this is where folks and experts like Jeff are invaluable in helping to make sure that the organization is set up correctly because while they may be focused on the operations and some of the other regulatory issues, all of that planning and documentation can be looked at by the IRS to determine whether or not the captive passes their requirements for a legitimate insurance uh, relationship. We're running out of time, so I'm going to pause there and see if there, um, if we have time for any questions, or Jeff, if you want to chime in with any uh, any final comments. I'm not hearing Jeff come on the okay. line. We have our contact information here. We would love to hear from you. It looks like we are out of time, and we don't. Uh, uh, we do have a list of all the questions that were submitted to us, and we'll be reaching out um, after the after the webinar to answer those questions with you individually. Uh, and with that, I'll turn the time back to Amy. All right, thank you, Chris. Yeah, due to uh, we are a little bit over, so we are just going to close out, and we will do our best to follow up with everyone on the questions that you did submit. And uh, their contact information is also in your console next to their bios, uh, so it's linked there as well. And here is a link to an online survey for today's presentation. Please take a moment to complete the survey as your feedback is very important to us. And thank you for joining our webcast. We hope you'll join us again next time.